Um, so we're here to talk about Pack Project Libraries. Um, how many people in the room have actually tried working with Pack Project Libraries? How many people have felt that they've been successful? And how many have used more than about 10 or 12 Pack Project Libraries? Over 100? Over 150? <laughs> okay, we've got 168 right now in our, in our usage. Um, and what we're going to do is talk about our kind of learning curve and how we got to being successful with it. So to introduce myself, I'm Mark Yednick. I'm a CLA and a uh, LabVIEW champion, and I work at Zebra Technologies. That's my coworker Ford, and I have to say, he's the one who struggled the most, not struggled, but endured the pain and got us to where we are today. He did a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, So what we'll cover today is a little bit of very briefly about us and, um, and our, our application and where we're using these, um, kind of what our design goals were as we approached this and why we chose to go down the PAC Project Library um, road, um, give you a little bit of highlights of what we actually achieved, and then try to impart upon you the things that we learned that made our life easier and actually makes using the PAC Project Libraries easier once you've understood that concept. Um, there's this one really key thing, if you don't understand that, it bites in the butt. And then we'll give some kind of tips and tricks and best practices and do's and don'ts um, that we've also learned over the way. As I said, uh, we're from Zebra Technologies. Um, we're kind of a weird breed of LabVIEW users because we don't test hardware, we're testing printer firmware. Um, so we actually have no hardware in our system other than our printers, and we are actually just communicating with our printers uh, for our test systems. And um, it consists of, oh, 250 to 300,000 tests per printer on, a, per, on an execution basis. Um, so it's a fairly robust, big system, and it's, a, it's basically a test executive. Um, it replaced test stand. Originally, we had been using some test stand with it. But this is a pure lab view test executive that is all kind of object oriented, plug in, loadable, dynamic um, that works with our printers. And congratulations, Zebra, we're 50 years old. Um, and that's our Zebra there that Ellen went to GCon Dev with one of our little Zebras after he came to a training thing. So, in honor of Ellen, we brought a Zebra here for him. Um, so, our design goal was really. As our system has matured over the last you know, 12, 13 years, we've wanted to do more things that were a little more dynamic because we were getting new printers in introduced, new printer languages that we had to test, and we wanted to go something that was a plug-in architecture, so we didn't have to keep rebuilding our system all the time. Also, that we built this as a test executive, we were rolling out new test steps. We don't want to have to rebuild every time we just get a new test step, if that's all that's there. Um, so we wanted something to be plug-in. We also wanted obviously easy to maintain, uh, something that was easy for the developers to, uh, to code with, and to separate our, our logic and libraries. Um, and it's also easier for us to fix because it's very modular. What we actually have achieved in this slide is a little bit old, because if you add up the numbers, it's less than 168, but so we keep adding to them. Um, we have two large-scale applications now using all of these PPLs. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was actually share our PPLs across applications. So we didn't want to distribute this application with its PPLs or copies of the PPL and have 19 copies on your computer because they're all deployed that way. So we pick a central location that we deploy to and our applications share those and use those. Um, they're separated into core libraries, which are just the core reuse functionality, um, as well as, let's say, the abstract classes for loading the plugins, and then plugins themselves, which are dynamically loaded at runtime. Um, we did, as an organizational point, it's not necessary that you absolutely have to do this, but from a source code, stand, uh, code perspective, we did separate our PPL source code into its own repository, which is separate from our application code. Um, and then we actually have copies of the built PPLs in our code repository that our source development points to those copies, not the final 
distribution copy of the PPL. Um, and then we just have our source code control for the application itself. Um, we're able with the plugins to deploy, like I said, new features and functionality to the application without having to redistribute the entire application. And one of the things that we have done is we do have continuous integration using the MDI Solution Explorer, which if you do use PPLs, I highly, 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 highly recommend you use that. It makes your life a lot easier. Um, and then we use Jenkins actually for our build process. Because once you start getting to lots of PPLs and you have to rebuild things, when there are times when you have to rebuild everything, that helps make life a lot easier as well. This is a class hierarchy, or most of it. And our PPL design very closely, I don't expect anybody to know, see that, but uh, <laughs> um, our PPL design very closely maps to our class hierarchy. Um, what we do get some additional PPLs for, like our abstract interface API PPLs between calling libraries. So we try to keep dependencies between PPLs to a minimum so that they're not pulling in all of a class just because they have to do a few cluster definitions or type defs out of it as an interface to it. So it doesn't have to pull in the entire class object and everything. In, but we, So we separate out kind of the common things that are shared among everything and then the actual implementations of the classes themselves. Um, so you can see quite a few things there. Um, a brief demo, this is the finished product. This is our kind of test executive. Shout out that this is an entirely written in LabVIEW. The entire, so I take some credit for our UI. <laughs> um, oh, this blank. What are we up? Uh, this is just kind of a short video showing it going through its operation. Um, and all the components then, or most of the components of the system, are all various PPLs loading sub-panels throughout all of this and switching between things and, and everything. Um, not trying to shed, say, go too in-depth into what this is, just showing what our finished product is. So, that's our test and replacement, by the way. So, we're not going to really dive into much about what is a PPL other than the most simplest way to look at what a PPL is is it's a container. Um, we got grabbed this off of I think it's Wikipedia definition or if you help. But a PPL is really just a single file container of stuff. Now what it is is a binary compiled code of your of your library. Um, it's very similar to an LLB, only the LLB of old is all source distribution. So it's a single file with source. PPL is single file compiled code. They're great for plugins because you have one file to distribute. Um, if you do plugins with a traditional source distribution and you have a fairly large you know, library, you have to distribute all of its source code with it. So deployment becomes a little bit of a headache. Whereas at least a PPL you're distributing single files of your plugins. Um, if you want to really dive in, this is really just for reference, if you really want to dive into more about what is PPLs and other people's experiences and how they use it, as we post our slides at the, at the you know, at the end of the week, these are just links to various um, pieces of information, articles, white papers that people have written um, on their experience with using PPLs as well. So from our perspective, from our perspective, oh, this is yours, was it? <laughs> if you like. Okay. All right. So um, these are really two concepts we're not going to define because we already done everyone in our daily development work. But something we want to um, get us synchronized when we jump into the next few slides that we can make some extension to what we already understand that what really a library is and plugin is. So um, a library is, is you know, PPL, you 
usage is most, uh, the most likely static reusable code that you can use for supporting all those plugins. Okay, what plugin is is that you can dynamically load it when the application runs, so they don't get loaded until we call it into memory. So that's the definition we want to get everyone clear. And the other says is really what is um, development at runtime. Um, everyone knows that. But it's a little bit different that in here, uh, we're going to talk about that later. That's something we need to set it in the view stack. Right, so let's move on to here. Can you speak uh, closer to the mic? Oh, yeah. So this is very uh, generic um, object-oriented concepts that we put into um, the design that we have you know, our libraries that take connection as an example. And then we have you know, five plugins for different type of interfaces. And we definitely have some dependencies that are supporting for the um, feature or you know, in, in, uh, in, internal functionalities. And then we want to categorize all those uh, dependencies into some sub areas so that you know either in file system or in the uh, class hierarchy we, we can have a better organization of the code. So that's how we want to organize it in, in here. And you will see more in detail how this is going to work out uh, in the next few slides. And about development and runtime, as I just mentioned, it's really something to set in the build spec, in the advanced tab that enable this debugging or just have it uh, unchecked. So what are the differences is that when, you, when we enable it, uh, we can open the block diagram that is being built in the PPL. And then we can actually put breakpoints in and we can even put a highlight and see the data flow. Although the size of the compiled PPL is almost twice as the size as when we turn off the um, checkbox. And in our turn, in the uh, um, MGS solution explorer, we can call it debug and release. One important note to, to know about the development versus, or debug versus non debug enabled in PPLs if you use PPLs and you distribute them to a third party, um, if you turn uh, debugging off, or debugging is disabled, all of your private methods are vi invisible to the end user. So they would not be able to see something there. And worst they could get is just CA sub VI. If they try to drill into a, a private sub VI, they would not be able to see it. If you turn debugging on, however, you can drill down all the way through any, even into your private uh, methods within your classes. So if you're trying to protect IP, don't ever release anything with debugging turned on. I have a question. So if I understand correctly, then, when you're doing your development, you have a project, you have PPL that's built with it, and with debugging enables you to see diagrams, which also have another copy that you're using without them that you're going to push it out to the test. Yes. So yes. Two, we, two pack yeah, and when we build, we actually build both versions at the same time. Okay. It's separate. It's, no, it's the same, same build spec. The MGI solution tool lets you actually, it actually modifies the build spec for you to check in on Actually, the MGI solution tool does not modify. We uh, did our version on top of that tool. We'll talk about that later on the slides. <laughs> this becomes probably one of the most important concepts to really understanding how to effectively use PPLs is, you know, everybody knows what LabVIEW, it handles path stuff for you for where to find VIs, some VIs, all of that for you. And if you do a build of a, an EXE, automatically it redoes all those paths for you so that internally as it pulls that code into your application, built application, it knows where to find it. The gotcha that most people run into with PPLs is that relationship, that relative path to where to load the code still exists between your EXE and what's the file on disk. So understanding how those paths get put together is kind of the thing that makes using the PPLs easy or easier or um, that you can effectively use them. 
There also is a gotcha on the Windows side of things that the path length is limited. So I'm, I'm really into verbose names and that's bitting us in the butt too because after a while you start, as you build these PPLs, your internal paths start to get longer and longer and then the next thing you know, fail to build, your path is too long. Thank Windows for that. It's only 2020 or 2019 and you know, <laughs> still using 640K. Um, but loading paths, once you build a PPL or build an application, all of that loading of the PPL is relative. And it, it's all, you know, dot, 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 something to location. And that's what trips people up. And I, I'll probably stress that several times, but that's the key thing to understand. Um, also, within your build specs, you can exclude dependent pack libraries. Um, if you don't exclude it in your build spec, and you build an EXE, you get a copy of every one of your PPLs dropped in with the application, and it references all your other stuff. Sometimes. Because if you're doing a plugin, you're going to where you want it to go, so you're doing weird things. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, Normally LabVIEW takes care of this for you and you, you're none the wiser and you really don't care that much about it. Most times people might find this when they do a build EXE and they do a dynamically loaded VI and that path is a little bit weird if they try to internally build the path themselves. Um, but the same thing applies then to PPLs. The thing here is that on the EXEs, most of it gets taken care of for you and you don't really have to worry about it. But when building the PPLs, that's where it comes down. And the path looks something like this. Uh, ooh, the color kind of stinks up there. Uh, <laughs> um, you have a destination. So the exported file path, and there's a sub VI in um, the palettes that can get you this information. Your exported file path is actually comprised of your destination, your final destination target file name, and then the relative um, path for in, within the hierarchy. And the target file name becomes the name of the PAC project library. So it'll be mylibrary.lvlib. Um, and then the internal path within that. And if we looked at, at this in a simple case, in our you know, mock-up of the Bluetooth class here. Um, the exported path actually is the path on disk, so it's, it is fairly long, We're not living by some of our own rules, uh, lvlibp, and then bluetooth.class, lvclass, and then you get the methods after that. Um, the sor source path is there, and then in the distributions, and everything, they're, they're also loading it from those areas. So the connection, which is actually using the plugin, finds it in this plugins directory, Bluetooth, on disk. Same, similar type of thing, however, now we start to see where that relative path starts to become an issue. Um, so connection is actually using some other things in, in the connection class. So it doesn't quite show the, the full relative, but... Uh, this is yeah. basically when most likely we encounter in our development that um, some, of, some of our generic dependency codes we may have for some string handling or some something else that may load it from another directory, not completely the same you know, directory with where those source code for the PPL is located. And then that gets the relative file system uh, path builds up internally. And kind of the, what the, the things, the important things are these green, well, or yet kind of yellowish up here, the green and that screen. Um, those are the, the paths, the relative paths to, to keep track of and the relationship to each other. And then a, another case where we're using. Um, the libraries and, and the plugins, uh, again, 
showing just various combinations of how these pads work. And of course, be careful of your name sizes. Um, so, with these relative paths and, and all that, how does that really come into play when you're actually building these things, deploying them, and working with the actual file system? Um, and how do how do you handle handle the build specs in that similar manner? So, what we ultimately want is to generate code that'll exist somewhere, and like I say, we use a common directory so we can share everything, and just keeping in Windows um, convention, we go to program data, it's an open public data directory, we create our own subfolder, um, Zebra LV Dev, and there's a little bit of difference there why we have an LV Dev and we have a Zebra um, program data Zebra tools, that's our debug or non-debug version. So we just throw them out there in two locations. Um, and then we have a hierarchy underneath it. Because we do have so many PPLs, we don't just throw them all in one folder. We try to organize a little bit. Um, and then it comes into play when we do our distribution and builds. And in this case, we're building this PPL, but it is dependent on all of those other PPLs. So it uses all of those other PPLs internally. Um, Is this example excluding all the dependencies? No, that's all. What do you mean? So when you build this, if you build this right now, it's going to build all the dependencies with the top of the No, it doesn't build the dependencies. It, you, you have that yeah. Okay. We only build the target PPL, but the green signal has a dependency PPL. Does it build both the deeper PPL and the non deeper PPL at the same time? Could you repeat? I was no, well, able does it build the debug PPL and the non-debug PPL at the same time? If you do it strictly from the build spec itself, you would have to build it twice and click it in between. If you use the Solution Explorer tool, you still have to kind of say build release and build debug, but it handles that checking in, in the, the uh, build spec for you, changing it. That was one of the modifications we made to the MGI Solution Explorer, yeah. is that we pull those different paths out so it handles it. And here's where you, now you can start to see where this dependency comes in. Internally, once you've built the PPL, this is its internal path. So you get these dot, 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 go to here. You know, so this is starting at its at its current location. It's going to go up three directories and all that, and then look for the folder libraries, communications, connection. Why is this important? Because actually when you build things and distribute them, where your EXE resides on the file system and where your PPL resides on the file system must maintain this relationship. And then if you don't, then things kind of fall apart on you. And it doesn't have to have, some file names have to be exact, some don't, depending on where that PPL library is. Um, PPLs that reference each other, these names, like the string handling, JSON toolkit, those names must still exist on the file system. Your root directory from your application doesn't have to be the same file the, the root name, it just has to be the same relative distance from the application. So if it goes dot, 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 oh, then you better find it libraries in that location, wherever you're starting from. So what's in the blue box, those things can kind of be fudged around a little bit, but what's underneath it in the hierarchy and the structure of your file system underneath, that has to remain consistent. <coughs> Any questions? Because like I said, this is, this is the heart of the matter of how to make these things work. Um, because what happens a lot of times, you'll build a build spec, you build a PPL, you'll run your, your application and it says, it's broken, you need full lab view development in order to work, and that's because it didn't find one of these PPLs. 
<laughs> or you can do that. And then all of the, the loading paths are relative too. So all this stuff in the red box, that's what has to stay consistent within your, fi your file structure on disk. You can actually relocate <coughs> items to different depths as long as the relationship here, if this is consistent, whatever that depth is, and a relationship to each other, are consistent. That stays the same for your. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. This is your bottom example. You won't run the YouTube. Correct. Okay, so um, Mark had already showed us our end game. So now I'm going to talk about how do we approach it. So, um, yeah, we definitely want to set everything in a build spec, and everything are able to set it in build spec to configure the way in file system that we want, where to distribute and where to load it. Okay, so first thing first, you need to set um, um, the top level libraries so that you know. When we build, we know okay which library to load as the primary li library. Otherwise, a lab view will give some prompting saying you have not set this yet. You want to go and set it, or you want to, you know, continue without setting it. But you definitely want to set it. And as you can see, we did not add anything for the dependency details to the uh, always included. It's not required and it's not necessary. Because that view is smart enough to know which one that has different VIs or methods in the class that's been using in the target program or in the target library to bring in. So yeah, the only exception to that though is if your PPL <coughs> contains a VI within itself that it dynamically calls, you then have to do it always include of that VI. Just as you would in the AC. If you're calling from this PPL to another PPL, you don't necessarily have to do that. But if it's an internal thing that's getting dynamically called, you would have to still put that VI here. I should put a zero there that you need to go back to the information to set up the names. But that's something, you know, you know we do. Uh, I'm going to skip that. <coughs> so uh, this is also basic that the next thing that we want to do is to take a look at the destinations tab and you can see when we create a build stack, that view will automatically create the first one, Bluetooth.lib um, LIBP, and then the supporting directories by default. So you don't have to take out that and the path for those the destination path will be the one that you set it in information unless you want to mask it or break it. But and you can also see that we have four extra um, items or you know destinations um, added. So what's that? And they are mapping to all the destinations in the um, project explorer, which I created. Those virtual folders also um, reflecting the file system hierarchy. To do that, it, you know, it's easier for me to know where I'm setting it to. And those are destinations I'm telling my uh, target PPL where you can load it when you compile it. Otherwise, it'll all fall into um, the default supporting directory, which is next to where you want you build your PPLs. And then when the PPL gets loaded, it's going to look to the space next to it to find all these uh, dependencies. And this is how you want to set it to where you want it to be loaded. At least, you want it to know where the relative path builds up, as Mark just mentioned in those slides. All right, so we create the destinations. It's not enough. We need to apply it that when we really build it, it's being built to the PPL. And then, uh, this is how you uh, configure it. 
just to uh, set destination for the containing um, items. So just to make this simple, I create a bunch of folders containing stuff from one location. So you don't have to go into every individual PPI and set it. You just set the folder. And that's easier. Now, when you do set the folders, it only works on the virtual folder immediately above. So if you go and set libraries, for example, to a location, everything below it goes to that same location. So that's why we sort of mirror our virtual folders to what the disk hierarchy looks like. And then, like Ford said, set that one virtual folder for all of the ones that are in that location and set them all for you. You can do it individually, but that's more of a pain in the butt, especially as some of our higher level or deeper PPLs that have lots of dependencies, then you've kind of got a lot of this to trickle through. So any questions here? Okay, let's move on. Um, okay, so we have already completed building PPLs. How do we use it in applications and distribute it? So um, it's some experiences that we found to avoid and have you build issue, which when we are loading PPL not from the distributed destination, I mean, uh, destination, but it's from another place that we want, like in uh, program data. So that we, we want to avoid some issues there. And we, to avoid that, we separate the projects for executable and install. So in this executable, you can see that we use uh, auto, uh, auto, auto populate. Yeah. So uh, it's not necessary to do that, but uh, in this way, it's just saving me time that even if it brings all PPLs that is not some of them are not being used by that tool I'm going to create. Like I said, LabVIEW is smart enough to know which ones it will use, and at the time it builds, we will only uh, set the path for those ones being used. It will ignore those are not being used. Yeah. That's, that's why you can see uh, the uh, communications there and then the preview here, they're not exact match. Because that you knows, okay, I'm just using connection dollar, con connection parameters, and socket control. Anything else in the same folder, they're not used, I'm not gonna mark it in the next scroll. when we do it. All right, so, um, and, and just to clear the, the point a little bit, we actually have two projects, one for building the EXE and one for building the install. You can put them both, you know, traditionally people put them both in the same project, but when you're doing a lot of this massive amounts of PPLs, there becomes some load issues as you're building your installer and the installer starts grabbing all these PPLs and bringing it over and it just is a lot cleaner to have them in two separate projects. So the second project for your installer, as the next slide will show. Are you still setting the multiple destination folders in executable? Yes, you're right. So um, configuring the build spec for executable is exactly the same as what we do for setting the PPLs. As previous few slides we go into, that all those uh, uh, source files, uh, destinations, source file settings, we all need to set as well, because they are um, considered as compiled code. Okay, so uh, Mark already mentioned that we separate it for installers. So let's move to that. Um, yes, we definitely want to separate it, uh, because I found, I found some issues when I open the build stack. It takes me like 10 minutes to just open the build stack for the install. If both the installer and the application are in the same build spec. Yeah. It's trying to calculate from the executables build spec what it is, and then it's generating stuff in the uh, build spec in the installer, and that takes time. So uh, if you do this way, you will we separate this um, project. We only need to set um, this uh, executable, compiled executable in it. It does not need to look into what's in there. It doesn't need to know. So it makes the process very simple and fast. 
And the other thing you will notice is that because this is in solid, we definitely need to distribute all the plugins as well. So plugins are also in here. That's the difference. You, you, we should also include plugins in installs. Absolutely. And then one difference is that in our case, we want to develop our uh, application that we can debug. So in the executables project, we are loading all the PPLs with debugging enabled, and we build it to the real distribution destinations. But then in here, we are distribu distributing codes. We don't want to distribute all the codes that has debugging enabled. How do we do that? When we separate it, that view does not go into again does not go into the executable to to parse it, to know, okay, you need to know this, and it's already low in memory, and you cannot do it. Now we can go all the debugging disabled code into the project and distribute those, so you get everything corrected, that you have your development with everything debugging enabled, you can debug, you can drill into the code in the PPLs, make breakpoints, highlight, you know, data flow, and debug it there, and we distribute it. You get all the code with the release that has the debugging disabled gets distributed. So uh, one more thing we want to mention because we have multiple executions, uh, um, applications that sharing PPLs. Uh, there is a little bit of problem here because when we only install one application using this method, it's going to remove all those PPLs being distributed in, in the disk. And then the other application will fail to start running. So how to solve that? We can extract all those PPLs into self-extraction files and then run the um, post installation to extract those files, even though they may overwrite the, uh, I mean, the PPLs in their installation. But at least in the uninstall, it won't mess up with another application. The eventual goal is to bring all this into packed, uh, into a package manager. So that package manager handles all those dependencies for all the packages. So because package manager knows what dependency it is using, is any other instances are using this one? Yes, then well, we don't remove it for you. So that will be handled uh, in the future. Well, in, in 2019. 20, 2019, as of Monday, will take care of that for us. Yes. <laughs> there was an issue in 2018 with using the NI Package Manager at that time with 2018 that it didn't resolve all of this correctly. But 2019 is now fully feature fixed, yeah. <laughs> um, and then when we're distributing and deploying executables, the thing they don't when you your build specs they don't have to point to the same locations. Um, they don't have to have the same ones as your final distribution, the, you know the name or the root directory. What's important is that file structure on disk and the rel the relative location to each other. Um, so it is kind of weird that if you build your your executable in this directory we call it, you know test automation lab executable decap plus. And this is the final destination on the install. As long as those two depths are the same, everything's working and everything is golden. If you do this one to say test automation, lab view executable builds Zcat plus, and then program files, zebra tools, this, it will break. So your exe build location must maintain the relationship of your install location. Saying that. Again, why are relative paths important? <laughs> the way it's broken down here makes sense, especially with the details being in the separate directory. Yeah. And then obviously, loadable plugins, our code generates, and we know where our location is, so it generates that integral path for us for where we're putting our release plugins. That's a, that's a known location to us. You can read it from file, you can, you know, do different things about that, but that's a dynamically uh, obtained path. It's not baked in, it's not a hard-coded constant somewhere in the block diagram. Yeah.
Okay, so um, I've mentioned the build issue. So what's the issue? When we have built a specification with executable and installers together in one project, uh, on the left, you see that when I'm opening the build spec for the installer, and when I set it to the destination I wanted to, and then, yes, it will bring all those PPLs together with it, and when it distributes it, it's going to also distributed all those debugging enabled PPLs with it and next to the executables. We don't want that. They mess up the whole you know, file system with the uh, directory we want to distribute it too. And we have to do some post installation to clean up the path so that no one can go in and steal all those code. And they're not in use at all. Well, because our executable already point to our uh, you know uh, program data, zipper tools that you know is everything loaded from there. None of the code will be used here, and they're getting distributed and, and you know messed up with. So that's the thing we want to dis also eliminate. That's why you know the uh, separate project. Yeah, so separating, well, separating them out prevents it from just grabbing this ghost copy of things that never get used and deployed and put on your system. And if, like you say, if those are debug enabled and you have IP in there that you don't want people to see, they can drill into it and poke around. Because if it is debug disabled <coughs> and anything that's marked as uh, private or um, is protected private, no, not, not, not public, public and protected are visible, are shown. Anything that's private or internal is not even visible. If you have a public VI that calls a private one, you see the private sub-VI icon, but that's it. You can't do anything. Okay, so one last thing to mention here is that um, by default, these exclude packaged libraries are being disabled. And in most of the presentations we gave for the reference, it's recommending us to enable it. Okay, so what's happening here is that the only difference is that well, after reading all these, you know, not human readable description, I, I read it a thousand <laughs> times to make sure I'm understanding right. The only difference is that does it copy the dependencies to the destinations we set it to? That's it. It doesn't change the fact that it's using relative path all over the place. So, so all it so really does is just Do I copy or not copy? Don't copy it, but this, this is the path. Yeah. But this yeah. also changes the behavior that, you know, when we uh, enable this, you can set the destination as where it's been loaded to. But it cannot be said when we disable this because that we will error saying, I cannot copy. You can't copy on itself. Yeah, yeah, I cannot copy to itself to overwrite it. That's some error. In, in the build specs, yes. In our actual source, we act, we keep a copy of the PPLs in our source area, right. and that's what the source points to. And it's just it's a copy of the same PPLs that are in our final destination, but we just the source points to uh, the location in the source. But we maintain that <coughs> same file file structure. It's just that one folder that's kind of yeah. Right, tools versus that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Makes sense. You do check that box. <coughs> yes. Actually, now this time we don't. No. Because uh, we actually literally wants to keep both copies, like you see that we have a whole file system copy that are populating in the uh, executable project that we bring everything in. And then we have another uh, file system hierarchy that contains all the uh, debugging disabled ones for in installers that we can distribute it. That actually gives us convenience that we don't have a, a mixed uh, file system hierarchy containing either or, or you know mix that sometimes we forgot which one is which. This is very clean that okay in this 
in the zero LV dev, we have everything debugging enabled. That's only used for develop development. And then we have a repository that does for zero tools has all the uh, debugging disabled that only uses for distribution. And that makes things actually easier, even though it's a little bit more work to do in front, but it makes your design clean and, and easier to figure out and distribute. And, and a trick that can be deployed there, so you let's say you you have a deployed copy of your application and you have to go on site to your customer to debug it. You can actually back up your release version of all your PPLs, drop in your debug version in the same location, and it'll run and you can debug. Just not do it at the end. And so you can kind of enable your debugging at that time. You We have left it unchecked because our build process is very controlled and we build in the correct manner. And so we don't really care if we just keep copying the same file will run itself. But the lab you throw error to copy it. Type library on top of itself. A built one you are, a dependent one it won't. If you're just copying a dependent library onto a dependent library, it'll not complain. We're not copying it onto itself, we're copying it onto the copy of itself. Yes. yes. So that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> And then, like I say, our build process is very controlled so that all this stuff gets built in the proper order and we're just thrashing the disk a little bit with some extra copies. So, as you're building all these things, some important things to remember, um, shout out to Dimitri, who's I don't know, one of the next rooms that are on here, is solid um, principles of the object oriented design. Basically, what this is really saying is, if, you know, this doesn't has nothing to do with PPLs per se, but if you design your classes well, following these techniques, your building of your PPLs tends to be very clean and non-problematic. If you don't follow these principles, then you can end up with weird circular dependencies and things like that, and and um, that causes problems. Um, also, where the um, open for close, you know. Uh, or open for modification, close for modification, open for extension, that's another thing. Is, you know, once you've kind of defined your APIs or your, your classes, you don't go back and change them when you've got this many PPLs, <laughs> because then you've got to rebuild and redo everything. Yeah. When we were clean, when we started with that class diagram in the beginning, it wasn't as clean as this. And it forced us to go through and really clean code up. And yeah, and you know, as you change things, it's like, oh crap, you know. I just changed that block or that front panel, now I gotta go back and redo everything. Um, but so the solid principle is very important. The in, and the other one that's very important is the dependency inversion. When you have two PPLs and they're depending on things, make a simple little tiny PPL that they can reference and share and make their dependency on that, not on the core library. Because if you make it on the core library, you bring everything with that core library kind of over. Um, so <coughs> some of the other things we do, like I say, APIs, keep APIs together, separate your protocols out if you can, because it's a lot easier than to drop in new protocols into your system, basically like a hell or an abstraction layer. Um, again, abstraction layers, lots of shared utilities. If you find yourself using common stuff all over the place, wrap it up as a PPL and use it. Um, the helper PPLs, we actually created a PPL for loading plugins because it was a shared technology or shared you know, algorithm we were doing all the time. So now all the loadable plug plugins have kind of a plugin, L, you know, plugin loader LPL or that project library for loading dynamic ones. So you can take all that common functionality, put it in one place, and then if you have to make changes anywhere, you don't have to go and update all of your your code to read, you know, change your loading strategy. You just go to the one area and everybody picks it up. Um, 
do not nest plugins. Don't have plugins calling plugins. It gets really ugly really fast. Um, Stephen Mercer said there's actually a, a weird, it cr creates a really weird loading situation inside a LabVIEW. It can actually break things. So a plugin can tell somebody else, can tell something else to load it, to load this other plugin. That's fine. It can kind of give the data of about which one to load. Just don't have a plugin loading a plugin. And then circular references. Don't do that either uh, because that gets really ugly and makes building really hard. And a good example of that one is the Actor Framework. Has anyone tried building Actor Framework in OPPO? Yeah, you kind of gets ugly, and if you do a replace LV, your actor LV lib, it'll break everything on your disk. Yeah. That's it, you can either take it out, or you can include it into your actor framework. However, when you include it, you can't get to the generate custom trace VI because it's private and it's buried and not visible. But those two, if you just build it, if you build both of these is packed project libraries. A, it's almost impossible to build the two of them separately because they depend on each other. Um, but if you build the actor framework and you go in, in your project and say replace actor framework with your LV lib, it'll mess things up on your disk. I highly recommend you don't do that. Um, most of the time, you can go in your project when you build these packed project libraries and say replace library with packed project library. Works great, no problems. 2019 now, you can actually go backwards. So you can go from the private library to your LVLib. The one exception is this one. It literally will break your code on your disk. I had to reinstall LabVIEW once because of it. So be careful of that one. OK, so MGS Solution Explorer is the application that we want to pro promote to everyone to use it when you are actually building anything, not only regarding to PPLs. You can use it to build uh, executable installer. We actually use this application to build uh, and in our Jenkins as well. This is the modification version this is the of the version. second version. <laughs> yeah. Yes. We're actually talking to MGA about pushing our changes back in. We found some things that we were making some of the things in Solutions for more generalized and a little more customizable. And so we're going to work in talks with them to push our code back to them. Okay, so only MGS Solution Explorer is not good enough to help us relieve our you know, pains. But we need a little bit strategy how to use it so that everything can be easier. So there are three things we want to do. It. First, we want to create individual solutions to projects. Well, it's arguably not a good, not a uh, you know suggestion, but we definitely do suggest it this way so that you know, later when you really touch down to one um, project, you don't have to enable, disable, or doing stuff in the solution. You just find a solution and do it there. So it kind of uh, makes it easier. And then uh, we also want to create a layered hierarchy for all the uh, library PPLs, and we do the uh, flatten hierarchy for the uh, <coughs> plugin ones because we don't nest plugins, so we can definitely do it in a flattened way. All right. So what, what what does it look like when we layer it? It's not like how it's been nested in the uh, class hierarchy. It's similar, but. Uh, let's say in layer one, we have no dependencies. In, I'm sorry, in layer zero, zero means no dependencies. Layer one, we have dependencies from layer zero. Yeah, yeah, at least one dependency from the layer below it. Yeah, and then layer two and, and on is having at, at least one from the previous that you know you build up. If you happen, uh, happen to have one that inserts, that happen to push, push out the hierarchy for all the dependencies. I'm sorry, to those PPLs who's depending on that. And this will be how it looks like. So we have our there is zero and there is one. Now your life will be easier. Just click the wrong button on the top level, it'll build everything for you that's being touched in the code. If you touch something in layer six, it only builds layer six. It'll skip everything previously. That's a little bit time when it escapes it, but 
you know, definitely not comparing to you have to go into everyone and build it. And then, yeah, if you happen to change something in zero, layer zero, it happens to build, build all, but you don't have to do it. You know, it'll do it for you. So we actually layer our solution files from MDI Explorer to map our, our <coughs> hierarchy. And they say the library on a couple slides in, in is the one that's like the build all. Basically, that one just says level zero, level one, level two, level three, and it'll build them in that order, and everything goes correctly. Yeah, so as you can see in level zero, in this structure, we don't have to care about orders. You know, because in level zero, it's Make sure it's been making sure certain that they have no linkage between each other in the same layer. So we don't have to worry about the hierarchy or I mean class hierarchy or independent um, dependency hierarchy in, in inside one layer. So it can be built in any order. You can definitely add it to which order you like. And then for the flatten hierarchy for plugins, as Mark mentioned, we don't have nested, uh, we don't recommend nested plugins, so there is no layer needed, it's just one flat layer, just one layer, and we put all into this way that they are actually yeah, just just linking them. It's, it's just organizationally, we build plugin solutions as well. We hope to put some other like white paper or some other stuff online because we've got some other things that we've done around this, but we're condensed the time. So on the community forums, um, I'm not going to promise that we're going to get there. It all depends on time, but you can look for some things. Um, if, if Ford posts, I'm not sure what his icon is. If I post on the forums, I have the sailboat crashing over the way. It's a fairly recognizable avatar. Um, forums and any questions we have about two minutes left there was a situation where we can compile the next Google any edit libraries show up with question marks no question mark repeat the question repeat the question um well he was asking if then a compiled executable, if it ever showed a dependent PPL as a question mark, where it basically didn't find it or locate it. I haven't seen that one. You said you saw it one time? Yes, I was. Thank you.